Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this important discussion on interim housing in San Jose, hosted by the City of San Jose's Housing Department. My name is Ramona Guarquez, and I'm the co-founder of San Jose Spotlight, the city's nonprofit news organization dedicated to independent political and business reporting. Today's forum will dig into interim housing, sometimes called bridge or transitional housing, and how it helps address Silicon Valley's housing crisis and puts a roof over people's heads. San Jose is home to five interim housing sites on Mayberry Road, Felipe Avenue, and three emergency sites built during the COVID-19 pandemic on Burnell Road, Evans Lane, and at Rue Ferrari and 101. Some are tiny homes, which many of you may have heard of, while others are modular or prefabricated homes. There are 289 total interim housing units in San Jose that can house over 400 people and more are being planned. People stay in these homes for anywhere from a few weeks to several months before moving into permanent housing. Today, we'll hear from a panel of experts on how interim housing can be a game changer for homeless residents. The recording um, today's uh, webinar is being recorded and the recording will be available on the City of San Jose's website, as well as its YouTube channel and also its podcast. So first we have Rene Ramirez. Uh, he is the Chief Operating Officer with Home First Services, which operates four of these sites. Rene joined Home First in 2015 and has spent the past 25 years in community services. He oversees the organization's client program and agency operations. We're also joined tonight on our panel by Reagan Henninger. She's the Deputy Director of the City of San Jose's Housing Department. She manages the city's homelessness response programs, which include interim housing. Reagan has over 25 years of experience in public service, nonprofit work, and policy development. Prior to joining the housing department, Reagan was director of policy and budget for San Jose Mayor Sam Licardo. Finally, we'll hear from a resident at one of the city's interim housing sites. Her name is Kelly. She was formerly homeless and she has graciously offered to discuss her experience at the Mayberry Bridge housing community tonight. So before we get started with the questions, we're gonna watch a short video to help you learn a little bit more about interim housing in San Jose. Uh, it has been said many times that the best solution for homelessness is housing. And so we are constructing these three developments, serving more than 300 residents not in four or five years, but in four or five months. And when I came here, I was so amazed, not only of the place, but the people here. And the people here are fantastic. From the guards all the way to the staff and um, the caseworkers. They accepted my dog here. He, she has all the papers and everything. Um, I feel like I'm home. Okay, I feel like I'm home. And I want to thank you, the governor, the mayor, the city, the county for doing a project like a, like this for us because this has been the greatest thing that had ever happened to me and I really appreciate it with all my heart because I feel safe here that we were being treated like people okay not a statistic but like real people and I have to thank everyone here. All right, so we're gonna get started with some questions now for our panelists. And I just wanna remind our viewers that we're also taking questions from you. So if there is anything you wanna know about interim housing, the city's plans for interim housing in the future, please drop them in the Q&A box below. And at the end of the forum, we'll go ahead and take some of those questions. Um, but the first question is actually for you, Reagan. Um, just sort of defining these terms that we work with, right, that you work with every day in, in the housing department. What exactly is interim housing? How do you define that? Thanks, Ramona. 
I know we don't make it easy. I think we throw out, you know, interim housing and BHC and EIH and it's uh, super confusing. But what it all is, is essentially it, it functions like transitional housing. And it was really um, born out of this, this crisis, this homelessness and housing crisis that we're in. And it, it feels so palpable for everyone. You see homeless encampments uh, in our parks and along our creeks and trails. Um, when you're driving through the city at all, I think is so visual for everyone. And in San Jose, there are over 6,000 people who are homeless, 5,000 of which are unsheltered, meaning they are living along our creeks and in our parks. And so really interim housing was like, how, how can we build something faster, uh, more cost efficient to get people from living on the streets to a safer, more humane environment where they can really, instead of focusing on living on the streets and focusing on crisis to how can they focus on their long-term goals. And so really that's, that's how it emerged, but basically interim housing just functions as uh, transitional housing, a short place for people to stay while they're finding uh, their longer term stable housing. That's very helpful. Thank you, Reagan. I think that's the key, right? That it's short term to bridge housing until they can get to permanent housing. Um, before we go to the next question, I did see that there was a comment from someone on closed captioning. I don't know, Ali, if you're still on, if you, you, you're able to turn on closed captioning or if that's available for this event, but, um, but hopefully we can get that on for you. So thank you for the comment to the viewer. Oh, there it is. I see it. Okay, good. <laughs> All right, so the next question, this is gonna be for Renee. Renee, um, help us understand a little bit about the process. How do people qualify and how do they get selected for interim housing? So there's there's two answers for that. Uh, right now, this is part of the city's um, solution to the COVID pandemic, right? So so right now we're very focused on getting people inside in non congregate settings and, and providing a safe place for uh, the most vulnerable populations in in our city and in the county. So we we're working very closely with uh, this. Um, centralized referral system, if you will, created by the city and the county in which uh, referrals are made to all of our programs, all of our shelter and interim housing programs. Um, again, based on acuity right now. Uh, in the long term, the idea is that these become a more true bridge housing for uh, individuals that are enrolled in housing programs, something like a rapid rehousing program where an individual has a subsidy they're going to get housed, but instead of spending that, you know, average, it takes about a hundred days to get people to get someone with a subsidy house. So instead of that person spending that hundred days out in the street, they can spend it at uh, at a place like BHC or EIH. So in the long term, that's what we're hoping to do: pairing these uh, interim housing programs with a subsidized program. But it, but but for now, it's part of that solution for. Um, the COVID pandemic. That's helpful. And is there a target population for interim housing or does it vary by uh, location? This is a question for Reagan, if you could help, help us understand that. Sure. So it varies by location. So our Monterey and Bernal site is for single adults. Our site at Rue Ferrari is also for single adults, but we can accommodate couples there. And then our site at Evans Lane is for families. And then our two tiny home communities, or we call them bridge housing communities, those are for single adults. Mm -hmm. Good to know that there are some in there for families, because that's something I know we often hear that it's important to be able to house families together and pets, as we heard from the video. So um, that's helpful to know. Uh, what are some of the supportive services that are available? So folks are in these housing units, what else do they get? What kind of support services do they get, Renee? So there's a full service team on site. So we have case managers, we have what we call resident advocates. Um, we have uh, mental health support uh, through clinicians. Um, so our case managers will spend some one-on-one -on -one time 
hold one-on-one -on -one sessions, building a housing plan with each individual, then working with them weekly, bi-weekly, at, at whatever, whatever pace the participant needs to start to um, access some of, the, some of the resources and additional services that they, that they are in need of. Uh, we also have, through our resident advocate team, just this kind of drop in opportunity. So an individual may be working on a housing plan and part of the housing plan is to do some uh, housing searches or fill out an application so they can come through and, and have a drop in session with one of our resident advocates, get support with that application. And then of course, you know, having some mental health uh, services on site is always helpful just with folks kind of trying to get reacclimated to a different environment. And, and you know, that can, that, that can be all very tough. Uh, for just coming into a new setting. Um, so having some mental health support on site uh, is really helpful. And, and when we're not in the middle of a pandemic, uh, we, have, we have plenty of learning opportunities for folks. We have uh, both volunteers and, and specialists that come on site, offer skill building workshops and, and you know, just kind of community building opportunities, if you will, for the participants that are on site. This is a quick follow-up question. Are there income requirements? You know, we talked about the types of, you know, families and single people and such, but what's the income range from extremely low income to no income, or does it kind of vary depending sure. on? So to be on, to be in, in one of these programs, or there isn't an income requirement. Um, there aren't any fees. Everything that we provide is, is uh, free of charge for the participants that are on site. That's really important to know. And and we want to hear from someone who's actually living in one of these units. So Kelly, thank you very much for being here tonight and for sharing your story. It's so important to hear from people who actually live this experience. Um, so I wanted to ask you if you could just tell our viewers a little bit about what it's been like to live at Mayberry. Um, well, um, prior to this, I was living in shelter, so it, it, and it sounds like hundreds of people. So it was, it was a little bit intimidating, but here I feel really safe. And, um, have a lot of privacy staying in the cabins and there's a kitchen that's open and available 24 seven. And also um, the staff and security 24 seven. And you know, it keeps me feel very safe and I have some privacy. So that's very, so it's, it's been, it's been a uh, well, stable. I've been about three years, three or four years. So this has been really uh, here. Yeah, very safe. That's, that's great to hear. Thank you, Kelly, for sharing your experience. Um, and, you know, we talked about how this is a bridge to get people to permanent housing. Um, so how does interim housing complement permanent affordable housing? This is a question for you, Reagan. Sure. So um, Rene mentioned it in one of his comments, but um, a lot of folks in our homeless response system have what's called, are in a program called rapid rehousing, and that is rental assistance paired with case management. And it's typically two years of rental assistance. But as Renee mentioned, it takes some time for folks who have that you know, golden ticket of rental assistance. Um, our market is pretty tight here, pretty competitive for market rate apartments. And it takes time um, or can take time for folks to find an apartment. And so our emergency interim housing or our BHC sites can function as that um, temporary place for people to stay while they're searching for their more stable housing. We've also seen um, some of our bridge housing sites, our Mayberry site has had folks stay there who are going to move into a permanent supportive housing location and are waiting for that um, apartment to get finished um, or to be ready for them to move in. And so they've stayed a few months at our Mayberry BHC, which has allowed them to come in from sleeping outside and to kind of get stabilized a bit before they go into their permanent supportive housing um, that's again, kind of how we envision it functioning as this temporary or transitional housing. But, you know, I will also just say, I think we're open to, um, this is a new concept for our county and for our system of care. And so I think we're really open to iterating as we learn how these are working and how they're serving our customers. I think 
we're open to changes in the future. Yeah. And it sounds like it's a faster solution, right? Because as we know, permanent affordable housing can take years to build. And we heard Mayor LaCarta say in that video that this, some of these are taking months as opposed to years, right? Yeah, I think that's something that we're super proud of, especially in the pandemic. We've been able to construct Monterey and Bernal and Rue Ferrari in six months. And so that is incredibly fast compared to um, a more traditional affordable housing development that has complicated financing. They may be getting financing from the state and from the county and the city and private sources. And it just takes time to weave all those funding sources together. And this interim housing has been fast because we've been able to build on city owned land and we've been able to um, change our construction type to these modular units that you just sort of plop down on your site. I'm making that incredibly simplified. There's a lot of, <laughs> we bring in utilities and sewer and water and all of that, but it's just been um, faster than your traditional affordable housing development. That's great to know. And um, Renee, you mentioned a little bit about um, income levels and having no income, you know, in order to be housed. So do, do residents pay rent to live at these interim housing units or how does that work? No, they, they don't, they don't pay rent. Um, not at any of these uh, interim sites. Uh, so the focus is really around getting people to that next step and getting them housed and working on their uh, housing plan and making sure that once they get housed, that they're able to uh, sustain their rent at that point. That's helpful to know. Okay. Um, and I want to talk to Kelly again for a few more minutes. Kelly, um, you talked about what it's been like to live at Mayberry. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about how staying there has helped you as you sort of get through this moment in your life? How has it helped you? Well, um, it has helped me. Um, like I said, there's a group of staff 24 7, and they're constantly asking how I'm doing and if I need any resources. And um, the case manager um, from Rapidly Housing, the case manager, he um, comes over here and meets with me once a week, and that has definitely helped. I have a safe, confidential space to see my case manager. And um, at Zoom meetings, I, I realized I could do this here. So that does help too. And I've, I've started the Zoom meetings too, um, but to get back into a job, make a job. And uh, we also, I'm able to actually save money too. So that's been really helpful to try to, um, I haven't been to save money. Like this first time I've actually saved money in months. So it's, it's been really helpful. And the workshops, they have us attend just a couple workshops a week. And they've been very helpful. And there are new topics that pertain to my life that are always revolved around housing and employment. So that's really helpful too. So. That's great. Confidential, safe. That's helpful. And just, just to be conversational, just to have the privacy. Yeah, so that's a Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. It's confidential, safe, private, and then giving you access to technology so you can do the job interviews and be able to use Zoom and other technology. That's great. Um, and since San Jose opened its first interim housing site, um, I know this is often a concern. We hear from neighbors and we hear from folks in the community. So this is a question actually for Reagan and Renee. Um, since San Jose has opened its first interim housing site, have there been issues related to crime, safety, loitering, you know, neighborhood disturbances? Has that been an issue? Um, I can start and then Renee can fill in anything, but all of our interim housing sites have security and they have a controlled access. So there's, you know, a main entryway that people enter and exit from and we monitor who's on site um, and request visitors sign in and there's visitor hours. So we really try and um, balance people's needs that this is their home and they can have um, have guests, but also we are trying to maintain a safe community for everyone. Um, and as I mentioned, we do have security on site as well. So I, I you know, it's really been um, very, a very easy transition into the neighborhood when we have um, established these communities. We also have 
um, for each site, all five sites, we have what's called a community advisory committee, and that's a group of local um, neighbors and nearby businesses who meet on a regular basis. Um, one, to hear what's going on on the site and how it's going. We have people who want to help, um, but also to discuss any potential issues um, before it becomes a real problem. And, uh, you know, we really haven't had um, any issues at, at any of our sites yet. Anything that you would want to add, Renee? Just, just to you know, kind of reiterate those those points, especially around those community advisory committees and and having kind of the local businesses and neighbors um, participate. And they've been participating from very very early on in cases like Mayberry, where we had community meetings for months before uh, the work even started. And and I I would bet that a lot of the folks that participated in those. Uh, meetings, you know, looking backwards, um, hopefully are, are very, are pleasantly surprised at, at what they've been able to see. And um, we haven't seen any major issues um, that, I, that I'm aware of. And even though, you know, the, the areas in which these uh, facilities have gone up, um, I mean, homelessness has been, it's, it, we're in crisis mode, right, just across the city. And in some of these areas in South San Jose, there's some um, some real issues out there with homelessness. So it's, it's really easy to, uh, to connect the two. You know, there's a homelessness issue and there's this new site. Um, but, you know, again, I, I'm sure if we look at uh, data, the statistics, there, there, aren't, there aren't many uh, reported issues around crime and um, any challenges that are connected to the sites. And it sounds like, Renee, you're saying that there's, you've seen sort of a shift in an attitude towards these sites, especially because of having that advisory committee that's involved in these conversations. Are you seeing that shift, like people being yeah. more open-minded to this? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think Mayberry is, is a really good example, just because it's been open for more than a year now, right? And, and we know that the community was really concerned about it. Uh, we have a community, community engagement coordinator assigned to this project and is constantly putting out information, hosting regular meetings with uh, the community folks and different stakeholders and making sure that uh, we have, we give that opportunity for input and feedback. Mm -hmm. And, you know, at, in, in return, you're seeing these folks that are in the community, the business owners in particular that are very involved and are now willing to give their time. Uh, you know, unfortunately right now we don't allow volunteers on, on our sites, but um, for a long, for, before that pandemic hit, I mean, we were getting a ton of involvement um, and, and a ton of volunteer requests. So I, I, I think that uh, these sites have really become part of the overall community. Yeah, and people are probably realizing something needs to be done, right? This problem, this issue is not getting better. Right. And something needs to be done, right? Absolutely. Okay, well, we have just a few more pre-written here questions for, for our panelists, and then we'll take some questions from the audience and the viewers. So if you have any questions for our panelists, please drop them in the Q&A box and then we'll get to them in the end, but just a couple more here. Um, this next one is also for Renee and for Reagan. Uh, we talked a lot about moving people through this process of this bridge housing or temporary housing into permanent housing. At the end of the day, that's the goal. Um, how successful has it been? Like how successful has the interim housing program been in actually moving residents into stable housing? You know, I, I'd, I'd say that for some of the newer sites, it's, it's probably a little early, um, but in terms of just overall impact, even for the newer sites, you know, I would call it a success just because capacity has been um, really high. So these these were quickly filled, and people are staying are staying there. They're they're staying, you know, housed, if you will, at the, at these newer sites. But when you look at a site like Mayberry, again, just use it as an example because it's been around for more than a year. Um, we're seeing that the folks that are coming in um, are, are moving towards housing a lot faster than the folks that do not come in, right? So we, we're seeing individuals that maybe were holding a subsidy and maybe have been holding it for over 100 days and not making progress. But when they enter um, Mayberry and they have this whole support system around them, they're moving into housing very quickly. They're moving into housing inside of 50 days, which is very good. Um, and 65, 
68% of the folks that have entered Mayberry have exited into housing. So it's still, again, very early on, but we're seeing some really good success uh, at places like Mayberry. Reagan, is there anything you wanted to add to that? what Renee said? I would just add, I think it makes, um, it makes all the difference in the world to someone when they can um, not be living outside, not be living in crisis where every day you're focused on where am I going to get water and food and a restroom, just your basic needs is survival and when you can take someone out of that environment and offer them a place that is safe um, a place where they have privacy a door to close a bathroom a kitchen that's what I have heard um, means so much to people I have a door to close um, I feel safe I have my privacy when you sh when you change that environment for someone from living in survival to they feel safe and they have privacy and they can then shift their focus to what's next for them. And I think that's what the success that Renee is just was just spoke about is that's what we're seeing is that that what an opportunity this is for people. That makes perfect sense. And, you know, and just in my years as a journalist interviewing people who are unhoused, one of the things we also hear is having an address, right? Just having an address where you can put that on the job application makes a huge difference. Um, being able to take a shower before a job interview, these are things that, you know, maybe we don't always think about, but these are deterrents, right? For people to find employment. So I think to Reagan's point, that makes a big difference. So um, this is our last question before we take some from the audience. And this one is for Kelly. Kelly, I wanted to ask you, what do you want people to know about interim housing? Something that we haven't already talked about or is there anything additional that you want people to know about interim housing? So, um, like I said, I'm just feeling safe. And the security here and the um, laundry facility here and also that you have a lot of support from the staff here and that you can come to them anytime. If you have any issues, so that's been really great, and I've been able to um, just not be so stressed out by where I'm going to sleep or uh, um, not having things I need. So um, it's been a blessing for me. So um, it's been wonderful. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I looked at it. it, it the staff is like, okay, and they they're always making sure you're okay. And they do take your they do have a session once a week, and they make sure everything is functioning, the air conditioner, the locks, the windows. They they and take care of that and they make sure that and you make sure that you're always there you know at least once a week so that's great to know too that if you have any issues that arise that you can definitely let them know and there's maintenance they clean the bathrooms twice a day and that's really great and then they have like absolutely kitchen like uh printers available so you just feel safe and secure you don't feel like you're judged here and they're all good chance to make friends with neighbors right you get to know your neighbors and people exactly. around Yes, yes, definitely. That does help too. And people are in the same place as you and they know where you're coming from. So that definitely does help. Quiet here and safe. There's cameras everywhere so you don't have to worry about feeling unsafe here and you know, having water right here. That's definitely. You have air conditioning in the room, which is very nice. That's very high. And they need a little bit of help. I didn't think it was weird, but it did definitely help. So it's been very nice. Absolutely. Well, I'm so glad you're there, Kelly. And thanks again for being here tonight to tell us about your experience. It really matters and we appreciate it. Um, and yeah, we're going to take some questions now from our audience. And I see there's about 13. We'll try to get as many as we can. And um, I'm just going to ask them and then whoever wants to jump in as far as the panelists can jump in and answer unless someone has specified that the question is for a specific person. Uh, but this first um, viewers asking, do, do you offer housing vouchers in these interim housing sites? So we're not offering the vouchers um, kind of at the moment, I guess. So there's, there's, you know, I mentioned wanting to kind of pair these types of housing programs with other rapid rehousing uh, type uh, programs. And so that's exactly what's, what's happening here. At some of these newer sites like Bernal and Ruferari, we have folks that are staying at our 
at our sites. And at the same time, we're trying to connect them to um, additional resources. And one might be uh, getting them enrolled into a rapid rehousing program that our own agency might operate. Um, we also have other, uh, other um, financial assistance opportunities through different funding sources in which we're able to support someone with say um, a deposit and first month's rent to kind of get them started. So there's some opportunity for financial assistance here, uh, but right now the sites are not operating with you know, a requirement to have, uh, to be enrolled in a, in a subsidized program. Okay, thanks Renee for that. Um, this next question is from Mark. I think you may have touched on this a little Renee as far as outcomes, but if there's more that you would, you'd be able to add, um, he's asking what outcomes are you seeing at the interim housing sites? For example, how many people are moving on to permanent housing and by what means um, permanent supportive housing, rapid rehousing or something else? Um, and you did, I think, touch on this too, but does everybody require a subsidy or can some people find employment and housing on their own? Right, and, and that's where I'm saying there's a combination of the two. And again, uh, a couple of these sites are very, very new, uh, but we have seen a handful of people that have exited already uh, to permanent housing, and it's been a combination of the two. Um, I believe we've had uh, a couple that were enrolled in a rapid rehousing program, and I think we have a couple that were um, just had some of that kind of financial assistance support through, you know, additional resources. Uh, but the bulk of the of the successful housing uh, participants have been out of Mayberry, where the program has been operating for much longer. Okay, for about a year, right? A little more than a year, yes. Uh, the next question uh, is, how many tiny homes or cabin sites for interim housing do you think there are in San Jose and in the Bay Area? I thought in my research it was 289 in San Jose, but I don't know if that number is the most up-to-date or if you have any additional numbers regarding the in the Bay Area as a whole. Yeah, I'll take that one. So uh, we, your number is right, Ramona. We have about 289 units that can house a little over 400 people. That's the five sites that we talked about. We are exploring and trying our darndest to do a, another uh, modular housing site or emergency interim housing site in San Jose uh, that could be another uh, 80 or so beds. And then there is a similar project in Mountain View that is also modular unit um, housing. But that's the sites that I'm aware of. I don't know, I don't have a sort of Bay Area wide um, number. I know for our county, we really want to do um, like a study or a report that looks at our emergency interim housing and our tiny homes. Um, how much did it cost? What was the cost per unit? How long was construction um, for any and all sites in our county? Just so we have that information. We think San Jose um, is really a leader in this type of housing. And I think it's great information to share for other communities who are exploring this type of option. Mm -hmm. And help maybe be a blueprint for other cities too, it sounds like. That's great. Okay, a question here from Cheryl L. And she's asking, um, it's a really good question because I know it's coming up uh, with some San Jose council members, they've been proposing this. Are we going to have sanctioned encampments? And uh, perhaps uh, she's recommending the area under the San Jose airport flight path, something is needed on a larger scale. So anyone wanna weigh in on that, the sanction encampment possibly? Yeah, I can. So um, a few weeks ago, council directed uh, the city staff to pursue sanctioned encampments on um, public land. So city land or county land. Um, and that's something we're working on, but um, most of San Jose is already developed. There aren't large parcels of undeveloped land that would be suitable for an encampment, even to find the 
five sites that we have now, we had to go beyond city owned land. We're leasing one site from the VTA and a couple sites from Caltrans. So there's not a lot of city owned sites that are undeveloped. So that's part of the work is sort of site analysis. Where can we, um, where can we put a sanctioned encampment? Um, and then specifically to Cheryl's question around that, that piece of property that's by the airport there's an FAA regulation that uh, says you can't have people living in that area um, because of, I think it's noise level and decibels with the flight path. So while you can have like commercial or daytime businesses, you can't have people that are there 24 um, seven. So that's sort of the trickiness with that site. I don't think we would get FAA approval and they were the entity that provided the city with a grant to purchase those that property. Um, so I think we would need their approval to do something like a sanctioned encampment there. That's helpful to know. Um, another question here about the future. This is from Elizabeth. She's asking, are you planning to do more of these in the city? So definitely we're planning at least one more emergency interim housing site. That's the modular type construction um, and potentially more if, if we can get two things. One is more places to build. As I said, land is um, hard to come by in San Jose. And then the second is additional funding and we have um, hopes that uh, Governor Newsom will include additional funding um, in this legislative cycle for projects like this. Mm -hmm. So the next question is, how long is the partnership between the city and the nonprofit Home First? So specifically, I know Home First operates four of these. Is there sort of this long-term arrangement between Home First to create more emergency housing units or interim housing units? So um, we're still, like I just mentioned, we're, we're exploring how to do more of this. Um, and then for every site that we build, we do do a competitive uh, bid or procurement process to find a service provider. Uh, and Home First is a excellent service provider and they're quite competitive. But like I said, we do put um, the new sites out to bid um, once we decide we're doing another site. That makes sense. Uh, next question, this is a really good one. Um, who gets priority to enter interim housing and how are the residents selected? How do you pick? Well, I, I, as I mentioned earlier, I think the um, right now it's more about getting people in a safe space. And so uh, between the city of San Jose, the county of Santa Clara, they, there's, there's a centralized referral system, if you will, we're taking folks off of that. Um, so these, these referrals come in, the, then kind of referred over to one of our sites, depending on availability. Um, when we are operating more like Mayberry was when we started, we work very closely with the county CLC. There's this, they have what's called a community queue, right? So every homelessness, every homeless person in the county that, uh, that, we all as providers may contact with, they go through a, an assessment and based on that assessment, they end up on this community queue and it's based on acuity. And you know we've been looking at this rapid rehousing um, tier, if you will. So there's these scores, this particular tier scores between four and seven, four and eight. And so we try to match up the folks that are falling in that tier, the higher end of that tier uh, are then, um, being referred over to the sites depending on availability. Thank you, Renee, for answering that. And I did see that one attendee um, actually raised her hand to ask a question. I think it's Amelia Rios. Amelia, if you could please drop it in the Q&A box, I'll be sure to ask it, but um, that's the way to basically ask questions. So if you just wanna type it into the Q&A box, we'll make sure to try to ask it. And there's another question here about kind of the, the stay in terms of how long people stay in these interim housing units. Once COVID lifts, how long do you anticipate residents will be living in these sites? 
And this person wants to know, will there be like a rotation of 60 to 90 days until they find stable housing? So there isn't a plan right now to exit anyone into the street. Uh, I think we'd all agree that's a bad idea just to be exiting people onto the street. Uh, the strategy is more to keep working with these individuals that we have. Um, if we're able to move people quickly through this, you know, kind of re re rapid rehousing system, you know, as those folks exit their rapid re rehousing programs, you can get more people into that system. Uh, so our plan is to continue to work with the individuals that we have. I mentioned earlier, we have a full service uh, support team on site. So whether they have a subsidy or not, we're working with them on a housing plan and making sure that these individuals are uh, progressing in that plan. It might take a couple of weeks, might take a few months, it might, it might take longer. Uh, but right now the plan is to continue to work with the folks that we have and not exit them into the street. Right. That's really important. You don't want to create this revolving door, right. which is very important. Um, another question here from an attendee they want to ask, and this is open to anyone on the panel. Um, what have you learned about interim housing over the past year that was hard to anticipate? It's a difficult question. <laughs> I think I have a couple things. I think one thing we learned in the design and construction is, um, especially at a couple of our sites in particular, we learned parking is actually super important, um, whether it's for the residents themselves or just making sure we have enough parking for all of the supportive services. So some people, there's the on-site staff that Renee mentioned, but also um, some of our residents are working with their own social workers or healthcare professionals um, who are also coming to the site. And so parking was, was one thing in the design. Um, and honestly, when we were choosing sites from Caltrans, you know, we sort of got what we could get. We, and the size of the parcel is the size of the parcel. So um, on some of our sites, there wasn't much we could do there. And we did some things around adding some on-street parking. Um, I think we also learned, a, a good thing that we learned is that people who are staying there really appreciate, um, one, the, all of the supportive services are there. They feel really supported, um, as Kelly was met, had mentioned. But I think they also really appreciate the outside space, the... Um, raised garden beds that we have, the, there's outdoor seating, there's a place for people to take their pets, there's dog runs. So I think people really appreciate that outside space. So I, I think those are just a couple of the things that we've learned so far. You know, the, 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 only, the only other thing I would add to that is um, I didn't anticipate how well um, how well received or how well the community would accept uh, these programs. Um, just because, you know, you hear a lot of challenges around, you know, new developments coming into, into these communities, you get a lot of pushback. Uh, and we definitely heard a lot of that in, in building up to these initial sites. Um, but I was really, I was pleasantly surprised at how well, um, those relationships have become. Uh, and again, I point back to Mayberry where, you know, you're now, now you're having the same folks that are in that community that had concerns before wanting to volunteer their time. Um, so that was, that, was a, that was a surprise, a pleasant surprise for me. One follow-up question that I have, a clarification, you know, I know site selection was a little tough. I remember it was hard to find, you know, it was narrowed down to a very few sites. Again, it has to be public land. It has to be owned by the agencies, right? The city or another agency. Um, is there any other criteria that you look for when you're trying to find sites for this? Like, how do you figure out where these, these interim housing communities should go? Sure, we need um, for the emergency interim housing, that's the modular build, we need about two to two and a half acres minimum for roughly 80 or so units. Um, and that would include enough space for parking and that outdoor space and then the shared um, 
kitchen and community spaces. And then we look for, is it close to amenities, um, transportation, being on a, a major bus line or light rail is really important as well. And then other kinds of amenities, like is there a grocery store nearby or a pharmacy? Like people need access to all of that. So having, making sure the site isn't too isolated or too far out there for people to access other kinds of amenities. And then um, we also look at how does the site already, or is it already close to those kind of utilities? Like, because that impacts costs. So how far do we have to go to bring in the sewer and the water and the electric? Um, so I think those are probably the biggest factors when we're looking for a site. That is really helpful to know. There's some very um, specific criteria that makes it easier to you know, erect one of these sites. So that's great to know. Um, another question here from Cheryl, um, she wants to know what is the plan for homeless people who have a severe drug addiction? I know you talked a little bit about the services that are offered at these sites, but how do you deal with, you know, substance abuse and, and drug addiction? You know, one of the, one of the best practice models that Home First follows is something called harm reduction. Uh, the idea being that you address the harmful consequences that comes with engaging in risky behavior. And so this is a model that we follow across the board and making sure that whatever challenges our program participants are dealing with, that we're able to support them as best as we can so that they stay safe. Um, understanding that, you know, kind of breaking addiction is a very long, very long process, very long and difficult process. Um, so it, it's really focusing on that and working with the individual at their pace and trying to reduce uh, the addiction or reduce the, the engagement in that risky behavior, if you will. But it, it really is a kind of long-term process and making sure that folks are engaged in whatever behavior they're engaging in in the safest way as possible. There's another question here a little bit about shared housing. We talked about some families, you know, living in these units. Um, so the question here is, is the housing included shared housing um, or are these all independent spaces? Are people anticipating that they're gonna get independent spaces or are there sort of these shared housing situations? I think there are shared kitchens, right? Some facilities, some community facilities are shared. Could you speak to a little bit about the independence of them versus the shared um, facilities? Sure, so our emergency interim housing, the, the modular build, um, residents have their own private room that has their own bathroom and shower. And the shared space is that community space, a shared kitchen, um, and then the shared office space and where the support services are and shared laundry space. And then it's fairly similar for our BHC or our bridge housing communities, those are the tiny home um, units, and those do not have a restroom inside the cabin. So it's, it's shared shower and restroom facilities along with shared kitchen. Renee, anything you wanted to add on that? Or that, bas that basically covers it. Greg <laughs> covered it. Sounds good. There's a there's several questions here, and you, you may have already touched on this. I know we talked a little bit about it, but a lot of questions here about are we doing more? Are we planning more in the future? And this sounds like the answer here is yes. The city of San Jose is looking at at least one more site, potentially more down the line. That's very helpful. Um, quick question, one more question here about subsidies, you know, helping once people are in the EH, EIH or BHC sites, bridge housing community sites, um, are they given grants or any other kind of subsidies to help them make rent in the permanent housing wherever they get placed next into the permanent housing is there any kind of assistance to help them with the rent there if if they are not enrolled in some sort of subsidy um, there's there's a ton of resources out in the community um, there's other organizations that have invested heavily in uh, in, in prevention and, and once folks are housed, uh, wanting to keep these individuals housed. Um, 
So if we're working with an individual and getting them housed, even if it's without a subsidy, you know, we'll be sure to connect with them. And if they are in need of additional financial assistance, if Home First doesn't have the opportunity to provide kind of that, you know, one-time support um, or short-term support, then we would connect with other agencies across uh, the county that might be able to. Um, so kind of tapping the resources that are out there and at the same time, making sure that the individual is budgeting and making sure that they um, have a plan to move forward with. Mm -hmm. Athena wants to know, are there other avenues for individuals who are struggling to find stable housing or perhaps individuals who get terminated from this program? Um, I mean, if folks are being terminated from this program, uh, you know, we, we also have lots of shelter opportunities. Um, you know, I, I mean, but truthfully, I mean, one of the reasons why these interim housing opportunities are so important is because of the lack of shelter opportunities that there are across the county, right? So, you know, the, the, the goal should really be around keeping these folks at, at these interim housing sites as long as possible, it it takes a lot for someone to ex to be exited out of these programs um, and not into some form of housing. Mm -hmm. I think and one of the Renee yeah. mentioned oh, earlier earlier. Maybe. I think it's a you know a last option to terminate someone from the program, as he mentioned earlier. You know, it's really about um, not exiting them to homeless, but working with them for as long as it takes to find that stable housing option. Mm -hmm. That's important to know. And, um, you know, one of the questions I think we get a lot is how do you get into this housing unit? How do you, how do you, if you're on the streets right now and you're watching this, you're hearing about this, these housing units, how do you get signed up? How do you get in? Um, and at the end of the webinar, we'll give you a phone number to call for the city of San Jose to go through the referral process and to get you know, hopefully moved into these units. Um, two more questions here, and then I know um, we're gonna turn it over to someone from SV at home who wants to say a couple of quick words, Corey Walbuck. But before we do, um, one attendee wanted to ask, you know, what is the time frame someone should expect from reaching out to being housed? You know, the kind of the time frame. You know, I, again, I think it just really varies. It's 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 such an individu individualized, um, plan that is being developed by the support teams based on the resources that the individual has, based on the experiences, based on how long they've been homeless and, and just kind of their their personal situation. It, it's I, I don't think I can give you, you know, a, a true answer to that. Mm -hmm. Reagan, I don't know if there's other data out uh, there that, that you might be familiar with. That one's tough. Um, you know, it's just so complicated because these are human beings with um, different experiences. And, you know, so it's so hard to, to say, you know, in 90 days or 100 days, because everyone's experience and their circumstances are unique to them. And I think what we can share is, you know, the just just to maybe give a little bit of perspective. Um, I believe the average across the county to have someone in a subsidy program, in a subsidized rapid rehousing program, the average I think is somewhere around 100, 110 days or so from kind of start to, to permanent housing. Mm -hmm. um, someone in it with a subsidy that has been participating at Mayberry is averaging about 50 day stay. Um, but again, that's with a subsidy um, intact. So just, to give, give it some perspective. Mm -hmm. All right, and this will be the last question from our attendees. This is actually a really good question because I know there's often some confusion between the city's programs and the county's programs and how the two are working together or not. <laughs> so Adam wants to know, um, how is the county's pallet home project, the one that's near the government center, how is that different from San Jose's program? Hi, Adam. Thanks for the question. So um, the, the difference, and I failed to mention it earlier in my response about, around what kind of, you know, tiny home projects are in our county or the Bay Area. 
the county is operating um, a interim housing site that is uh, called pallet shelters. It's a prefabricated um, little pod that's made off site and you plop them down um, wherever you would like. They're pretty transportable and they are operating. There's 25 pods at the county site and it's for families. Um, and I would say we do coordinate in terms of lessons learned, and we also coordinate in terms of referrals, the referrals for that pallet shelter program, as well as for our family emergency interim housing site at Evans Lane. They're going through a centralized um, countywide shelter hotline number. Thank you for clarifying, Reagan. And we're almost out of time. So I just want to say thank you to all of our panelists for this very meaningful conversation on interim housing in San Jose. We all learned a lot. There's a lot more to learn, but this was an incredibly helpful panel. Um, and if you would like to learn more about the city's interim housing opportunities, including how to be referred into these units, please call 408-278-6420. I will repeat it. It's 408-278-6420 to learn more about the programs and to learn how to be referred. Um, and as we wrap up, we wanted to hear from Corey Walbuck, who is with uh, SV at Home, which is sponsoring, as you know, this Affordable Housing Month. Uh, they're the reason we're doing this, this panel today. So um, Corey, are you here? Be able to say a couple words? I am. Uh, thank you so much, Ramona. Uh, hi, everybody. I just want to say thank you so much to the city of San Jose and the panelists and Ramona for moderating and everybody who spoke today. This has been such an informative conversation. Uh, as Ramona said, uh, my name is Corey Wolbach. I'm with Silicon Valley at home. Uh, we are the conveners for uh, Affordable Housing Month every May here in Santa Clara County. Um, SV at Home is a membership-based organization and we're dedicated to creating a, um, a Silicon Valley where uh, everybody has a safe, affordable and stable roof over their head. We're committed to a future with a more vibrant and equitable Silicon Valley. Um, this year, the theme for affordable, affordable Housing Month is Silicon Valley is home. This month is dedicated to our community. Whether our families have lived here for generations or are just settling in, Silicon Valley is where we live. It's where we want all of our neighbors to be able to stay. Uh, we invite you to register and attend more Affordable Housing Month events this month. Uh, I'll share a link, uh, but it's bit.ly SB Housing Month 2021. I'll, I'll share it in the Q&A. Uh, and um, also, please consider learning more about SB at Home and becoming a member. Um, and again, thank you, everybody, for putting this together, and thank you, everybody, for attending. Please let your neighbors know Silicon Valley is home. Thank you, Corey, and thanks again for all of our attendees today for being here. We appreciate it, and thank you to our panelists for this great information. Hope everybody has a wonderful evening, and take care. We'll see you soon. Thank you very much.